It was an orchestrated plan since colonialism, independence and freedom concepts we don't understand because it's been about money and it's been about land, extraction of resources at the expense of man. I hope you have Calm one. Down, right. hello, hello, hello. Come again. <laughs> Wheel again. <laughs>
my father is was God rest his soul a professor of economics and um, yes somehow somewhere I found myself pursuing my studies in Toronto Ontario where I met Sajda I had just put in my resignation at the bank um, <laughs> I you know I was a little bit fed up with the corporate environment and I didn't really feel good about selling you know credit products and so called mm. investments to to people it didn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. And I having a phone conversation with Saj, then she said, you know, well, that's really because you're actually a teacher at heart, you know, and, and we see that in everything that you do in your interactions with people. So stop wasting your time and putting your application for a teacher education okay. program. Okay. Right. She's she's kind of pushy. She, yes, she yeah. is. She is. Um, <laughs> I, I would call it wise. Yeah, you, you, know, you, you called it, you call it what you said, and here he is. Indeed, indeed. Yes. And so I, I, I did take a leap of faith and I put in my application. I, I do feel that it's my calling. Mm. Yeah. So you came from, from a history of teachers in your own family and now find yourself many years into the profession you've taught in several different countries around the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, the reason I'm having you on the show is both because you have deep roots in the continent, but, but also you've taken those roots and you've thought about the field of education, not just as practitioners, but also as some people who want to teach teachers. You want to you know, share some of your experiences as learners, I think, and also mm -hmm. as educators. And so you've developed a company that has now gone around and developed workshops to empower schools, empower educators and administrators to incorporate philosophies of indigenous education into their work. And so your organization is called Indigenous. That's right. Am I saying it right? Yeah. Indigenous yeah. Teaching and Learning, a very very clever play on words. Tell us what that means and, and why you felt that was necessary. Mm. So it's hard to Google, right? Because <laughs> uh, autocorrect uh, always defaults to in, uh, indigenous. Mm. And so indigenous is basically a play on word that aims to honor the genius within indigenous cultures. Mm. As you know, in a uh, post-colonial uh, era, many of our school systems are um, colonial legacies in, in many ways. And so what we attempt to do is to honor the fact that uh, indigenous cultures have had educational practices, principles, and ideologies uh, that are worth preserving and incorporating within contemporary educational systems. Uh, and as we know, as we progress or so-called develop, we realize that in many ways our societies are actually regressing. Mm -hmm. So concepts such as sustainability that are now emerging and a big yes. talk you know, you go back to indigenous societies and you see actually they were living sustainably, sure. right, yeah. in, in many ways. So uh, that's our driving force to, um, you know, research these indigenous ways of learning and to uh, attempt through them to decenter the dominant culture within contemporary school systems. You said so much. I'm, I'm going to try and stick with the, the last thing you said around decentering the dominant culture. That's a really powerful statement. Tell me maybe about how your background um, as uh, uh, Sudanese, as mm. immigrants, informed that principle mm. of the need to decenter the dominant. You know, how do you, how does that personal experience, or maybe it doesn't, but how does that connect to your pedagogy that you're now applying in your classrooms, mm. as well as helping other teachers and administrators understand more deeply, so that they can bring it into theirs. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing we always say is a lot of our experiences as marginalized people has, have given us superpowers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think no matter what, you know, what your identity is, when you see a child who reminds you of your brother who experienced a very similar form of oppression in the classroom, whether it's because of their learning um, needs or because of the skin that they that they have or the hair color, you know, their hair texture, whatever the case is, you now are able to see that child on a different level. So I think in terms of decentering, we always say it is our experience as you know, young people living in that margin in a school system that you might be in a school system where everybody has the same skin color as you, but you're still functioning within you know, a Eurocentric mm. schooling system, mm. you often feel invisible. Mm -hmm. And I think having come out of that, and we know that many of our most beloved people did not necessarily come out of the school system you know, intact or feeling whole. Or successful. Right, and I think it's a process. And right. as, we, as we kind of unpack that process, it gives us the ability to really see a child who's experiencing something that maybe someone who is of the dominant culture may have to work a little bit harder mm. to see. So I think that that's really the, the power that, that lies within not being centered and then knowing how to bring people to center. Mm. I mean, for you, you know, being born in Khartoum and, and spending time in Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, what, what parts of that culture show up for you in the classroom in the way that you practice education? Mm -hmm. 
That's a good question. Cote d'Ivoire is actually the, the, the right way. Uh, Thank you. Yes, yes. I try. Yes. He's, so, teaching. He's teaching right now. Ultimately, as, you know, just to echo a little bit of what Said just said, as um, quote-unquote racialized people, you know, who've learned to, or through our experience, learned to navigate a Eurocentric school system, I mean, just take the language that we are uh, using to express ourselves here, and which is our strongest uh, language. Mm. You know, we, we are far from being proficient in our own native tongues, which, mm. which are dying. Again, English is in itself a colonial legacy. So we've had to, through our learning experience or through our educational uh, experience, and I'm talking about educational institutions, we've had to fit into a mold, yeah. right? So many elements of your identity you would have to leave at the door mm -hmm. and constantly you'd feel a pressure to fit in a particular culture or to not stand out uh, to the point where, you know, I mean, oftentimes, and, and we can get in, into more depth later, but it manifests itself in... in um, you know, self-oppression mm. and manifests itself in, in many ways, whether it be physical or mental or behavioral mm. in many ways. So as we go through the educational process, as we heighten our critical consciousness, uh, we realize and uh, begin to unlearn and make room now for new learning. So mm. that's as much of what we do now. Yeah. Uh, so it's that double-edged experience because yeah. it was painful in many ways, but also we've gained many privileges as a result that, you know, allows us now to be sensitive to students who are in the same predicament, but also to systematic barriers that do not work in favor of anybody. Yeah. True. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you, you know, I want to get to some of the ways that you're finding solutions for identifying those barriers, navigating the systems, because we, I've had conversations recently, actually it was just uh, the other night, Sasha, when we were on book club, talking about systems of education. And if you're in a system, you you have some options, right? You Do you burn it down if it's not serving you? Mm -hmm. Do you opt out of it yes. and find a whole nother system? Do you, yes. you know, especially with education, do you homeschool your kid and take them out of the system? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times parents don't have those options, right? You have to be resourced sometimes to, to have an option at all. Yeah. Yes. So when we don't always have the option, you know, what are some of the ways that you are helping your students mm. navigate these systems? Because they might have you for a year, right. but then you send them off into the next year and then the next year, and then they move and they go to another school or whatever it is. Mm. You know, what are some of the, the, the tools that you're putting into their toolkit mm. so that as they grow and mature and they understand the world and they see the world, they can navigate it, whether it's in a classroom or outside of it? Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned a few minutes ago the idea of us teaching teachers, and actually we're, we're also learning. So yeah. um, I think a big piece of this is that we're learners, and that's how we position ourselves with our students. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most powerful things we can do with our students is just be real, authentic learners and show them that this power dichotomy of, you know, I'm supposed to have all the knowledge here, and now I'm going to download it onto all of you. That's, I think, the first way that we can teach them to be revolutionary, mm -hmm. is to, to notice that not one person holds all of the knowledge and you have the right hey, or to the question, power, or right? The power. Yes. Right. And it can be a scary thing, I think, for a lot of teachers when you have this classroom of students and they're all different and they're talking and, they're, and you feel the need to really control, to control that space. But I think in, in letting go of that and, and showing students that this is who I am and I don't have to put on this active authoritarian with you, mm. we can engage in critical dialogue. You can ask me a question, even if I disagree with you. I think it's that practice Mm -hmm. That really is, those are the tools. Mm -hmm. Those are the tools to be able to question, mm -hmm. to say, you know, I've had a student, for example, one of my early years of teaching in an almost all white and East Asian, you know, demographic. And I'm here, this black Muslim woman, they've never had a teacher that looks like me. And I remember I had a student call me out and say, how come everything, you know, all the material you're using are, are all black and brown people? And my first instinct, especially that I was an early teacher, was to say, to reprimand, to say like, well, that's an inappropriate question. But really I understood what he was saying and I had to check myself and step back and humble myself and say, well, well, if they were all white, would you have asked me that question? Or is that just what we've become so accustomed to that now seeing, and they are not all brown and black, mm -hmm. but now seeing some, you almost feel like this is an attack on your identity. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that. And we had an amazing conversation. Mm. It took, you know, completely pivoted the lesson plan, but I think that's what it's about. It's about creating a space where kids can be their, their genuine self because mm. they see you also doing that. 
it's interesting because you're not giving us an easy answer here at all. <laughs> you're just saying some of what the teaching is, is the modeling. It's the yeah. living it out day to day in your classroom. Right. It's how you talk to a kid when they're like, I need to use the restroom. Yes. It's how you, know, how you talk to a kid when they come in late. It's mm -hmm. when they, they're struggling. It's, it's how you interact with those children in addition to how you engage with the material yeah, that right. shows them this is how you can exist in a system that doesn't serve you. And I think also to explicitly let them know that I don't hold all the power here. I'm yeah. also a learner. Yeah. You might ask me a question mm -hmm. and I don't know the answer. We can find out together. Yeah. I think that is, the, that is the lesson, which is that we're all learners. So there's yeah. nobody that has the right to hold complete control or power over you ever yes. in your life. That's big. That's big because, you know, we, we can talk as much as, as we want about kind of oppressive systems, but even here on the continent, our educational systems, mm -hmm. which, as you mentioned, I mean, our holdovers from yes. legacies yeah. that did not serve yes. us are really built yeah. on... <laughs> teacher as superior, yes. teacher mm -hmm. as authority, yes. teacher as the final say. Yes. And both my parents were teachers in Ethiopia. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, a lot of that crept into our home to, as, as parents and, and, and in a positive way. But they would tell us kind of horrifying stories of mm -hmm. the way discipline was handled, <laughs> yes. you yes. know, and, and the interaction. And, and you see it now. I mean, I've spent many years on this continent as a consultant Absolutely. in education. And mm. You see the heavy handedness of our African teachers to our African children. And yes. so I guess I have two questions there. One, how do we as, as, as fellow Africans engage with our other African teachers who are living with a system that they themselves came mm. up in? So mm. the only way they know is what they came up yes. in, right? So it's hard to do something that has never done for you. It's hard yes. to teach what you've never been taught. Yes. yes. So that's my, let me see, let me just give you that question. Okay. <laughs> And then I'll go to my, mm. my follow up. Mm. Well, in not the that there's that, an easy answer. Yes, no, there is not an that easy not answer. An easy, and yeah. we're still figuring things out as we yeah. go, you know. But I think it's important to identify the root causes of things, as you say. For teachers, for example, uh, to recognize that the models that we are using are colonial legacies, you know, that they come at a time where we, and I say we as a pan Africanist, as a pan African, we're experiencing a violent occupation, right? I mean, and, and politically, socially, and education is, you know, where we socialize our students to prepare them Absolutely. to behave in a particular way in society. You know, edu educational theories such as Paulo Freire say that you cannot separate politics and history from education. Mm -hmm. Things, you have to have context. Mm -hmm. And to understand the context of the school and education as an institution is necessary to then make the necessary adjustments or to unlearn any traditions that no longer serve us, including, you know, the power dynamics between student and teacher. Yeah. For example, one of the many things that then I do with our students say, hey, Mr. Hussein, can I go to the washroom? I say, well, going to the washroom is a human right, you know? Yeah. You shouldn't have to ask me to go to the washroom. Then we, we have to put that in question. But again, you know, if we're giving you a little bit of power, how are you going to use that? Are you going to misuse that and open yourself? Yeah to assault by other people or to other people misusing their power towards you. So also teaching students and teachers to be mindful and cognizant of their power dynamics mm -hmm. um, and it's a reflective process, yeah. I think is the first step. And I think too, to add on to that, I'm thinking about, you know, working on the content, continent um, and thinking about some of the legacies and, you know, the work that we do with, with teachers when we sit together and we're doing workshops, I think one of the very first things we do is reflection and we reflect on our own experience. I think that as a teacher, if you have not sat down and thought about what was my experience like as a student, when did I feel empowered? When was that moment that I was made to feel so small? Mm -hmm. When was I made to feel ashamed of who I am? When did I you know, hide parts of who I So if a teacher does not go through those reflective mm -hmm. questions and that yeah. process, it becomes very difficult to remove yourself from that space where you're now reproducing the same harm and the same oppression. Absolutely. So I think that would be, that's always the guidance that we give ourselves and that we start with other teachers is mm. reflect on your own experience mm. and now think of the power that you hold standing in front of these young people mm. and how are you either reproducing that harm or how are you breaking that, mm. you know, the same yeah, thing because you know, parents. Handling, yeah, because yeah, when you say that too, the, the opposite is true too, right? If they reflect on a time where they felt big, where they felt empowered. seen and they felt empowered. Mm. I mean, I, immediately you say that I think of Miss Brownlee mm. yep, who in fifth grade, she she wasn't even my homeroom teacher, but mm. she was the first black teacher that mm -hmm. I had had that close of an encounter with. I was in the U.S. Mm. Who was another homeroom teacher for fifth grade. I didn't have her, but she was close. And she used to race us at recess, like mm -hmm. take off her shoes and like run <laughs> and race us. Um, and I became very close to her. It was a time in my personal development where I just needed a Absolutely. black mentor. I'd never had that. Mm. 
in my educational experience. And she came to my high school graduation. And we stayed in touch and stayed close and it meant the world to me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and she opened the door to me to also say that black teachers are actually in your corner. I know that won't always be true for every teacher, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it was a signal to me that I then started to seek out those teachers mm-hmm. throughout the rest of my career, you mm-hmm. know? So let me start here. Please do. If you don't yeah. mind, because I have something fresh. I have two stories. Okay, please. All right. The first one, ironically, you mentioned earlier that sometimes we reproduce particular colonial legacies. Mm. This is in grade three. Ironically, um, an African teacher, very loving woman, but an, uh, an African teacher, but of course spoke with a British accent. So mm. you can tell already mm. how uh, her educational background mm. was. <clears throat> we were at the carpet reading. Wait, what country were you in this? Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire, okay. We're at the carpet reading collectively and my best friend at the time was reading, I think, a Calvin and Hobbes or some kind of comic strip, okay. RT magazine or something, and then flagged me, and we both started to take a look at it. He was showing me something, and I remember very vividly, it was like, <laughs> the, the guy's shorts are so small, you know? How can somebody's shorts be so small? And we were just laughing, and then we got, of course, blasted. She put down the book, she went hard on us, mm. and... I mean, we, we felt it. Of course, we were in grade three. Felt what, though? A whack? No, we felt... No, we, we felt the shame. Mm. We were being disciplined in front of our peers, and mm. she got very angry. And my friend looked down like this. And after mm. she was done blasting us, she said, you, you don't even give me the respect to look me in the eye. Mm. And at that moment, something clicked inside of me. At mm. that age, grade I understood... Three. I understood that this woman misinterpreted the entire situation. Mm. And she wow. went even harder on my friend. And, and he was also Sudanese, and I was Sudanese. And I know from our culture, you if look, you look at a parent or right. an older person it's as their discipline, it's a sign of defiance. Exactly. So he was yeah. showing her respect by looking down. She operated in a Western framework. Mm. You're mm. not maintaining eye contact with me. It means mm. you're being disrespectful. Mm. And she escalated the matter even mm. further. So at a very young age, I knew we were... Yeah. Having to navigate Operating in two cultures. different systems. Yes. Did you tell your parents about that situation? I, I, I did. And how did they react? I did. They understood. Yeah. They yeah. understood. And I'm sure that they did work behind the scenes too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. they were very wise in not putting ideas into our heads. They would listen. <laughs> they knew, the, they they knew they who would, Amin was. Yeah, let's, they, let's put this fire out a little yeah, bit. It's yeah. Not, mm-hmm. This fire will grow Absolutely. eventually. So yeah. that's one, one example where mm-hmm. we felt oppressed in a situation, mm-hmm. ironically, by one of our own yeah. as a Pan-African, of course, I would say. Yeah. Another situation, this is a, 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 a situation where we felt empowered. Uh, we were lining outside of our art class. One of the teachers that left an imprint on us. And in this case, since it was a positive yes. uh, experience, I give a shout out to Mr. Brown, our uh, art <laughs> teacher. Also. Yes, and this uh, is also same school? In, in Cote d'Ivoire, okay. yes. Uh, you know, a uh, brilliant art teacher, a Black Panther, football mm. player, athlete. Anyhow, me and a friend of mine, Got into an altercation one. outside of the door. Fist fights, it got violent. Okay. He came out, of course, and one, you know, he's loud. One time, we all settled down. Eventually, he brought us in, and then he settled the class down, took us outside. And he said, well, we're going to do this one of two ways. Either I send you guys to the principal's office now, and they're going to document this and put it on paper. It's gone on your mm-hmm. record. Your parents are getting called in, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Or you guys squash the beef now. And I decide how I'm going to discipline you. But it's going to stay here amongst us. Right? So rolling the dice here. Yes. And we looked at each other and we said, no, let it stay here amongst us. <laughs> so uh, we squashed the beef. And then he pulled out his yardstick. And it was not a flat one. It was a cube. Okay. 4D or okay. 3D yeah, yardstick. Yeah, yeah. And he said, both of you guys are going to take one whack. What? And we said, fine. He said, assume the position, put your hands on the desk. And then he swung. And then when he got close, he just said, tap. You're kidding. Go back to class. That's, that would be unforgettable. It is unforgettable, yes. And Mr. so Brown. We, we, we under, I understand now as a teacher that, you know, we have some schools also place teachers sometimes in a position where they have to act as reporting agents, mm. where you have to document particular things and mm. for liability issues sure. and child protection and so on and so forth. But sometimes it does not serve the child. It works against them, especially in a yeah. system, you know, that might see a black child as more violent than another child. Absolutely. And he realized that he knew he was one of the very few black yeah. teachers that, that would, you know, s- stick his neck yeah. out there for us. So he was wow. putting actually his professional practice somewhat at risk is a manageable yeah, risk of course of but course. 
Nonetheless, it is a risk that not everybody is willing to take for their students. Mm, listen to that. Mr. Brown. Shout out to Mr. Brown. So we got a Mr. Brown and a Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown, I'll tell you something about that word, Brown. <laughs> So, Miss Brownlee, if you're listening, shout out. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and to all she the really other millions in my life. Yeah, Miss Brownlee. Brownlee's all around yeah. the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. The first teacher that I felt truly saw me and spoke in a way that I was like, wow, this is inspiring. Didn't happen until I was in university. So, I went through 12 years of schooling and never felt a connection with, unfortunately, a single Any teacher. teacher. Wow. Um, until this adult, you know, woman that I became, and I'm a young woman on campus. And it was one teacher who, God rest his soul, mm. Arnold de Toiro, I'll shout him out. Mm. Um, I keep a photo of him on my wall mm. um, because he spoke in such an honest and humble and truthful way that it just completely, you know, created the space of hope for me that, wow, mm. we, we could be, we could be yeah. truthful and we could mm. be honest. And he was, of course, mm. you know, they're always trying to tear down his courses yes. and, you know, tell, you know, discredit whatever it is he was trying to do. But I think it was just the truth that he spoke and the love that he had for the diaspora, for Africa, for mm. truth and justice, mm. that for me, I said, wow, I, I, I think I could do this. So my follow-up question is, is I want you just to define in that context of both teaching in the continent, teaching in international schools, teaching in local schools, teaching wherever teachers may find themselves, because mm. yes. teachers that I really do believe are the heroes of our society. I mean, at times, very, very thankless work. You know, what does social justice mean in, in education? Or education is social justice. What does that mean to you? When you say mm. that sentence, mm -hmm. what does that mean? And what is that asking teachers to do? Mm. Mm. Many people have said before us today that, you know, education is really meant to prepare you for the life that you're going to live. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't, then it's not serving you. And I think that when we talk about you know, schools as these colonial legacies and the fact that they, you know, they center some, but also exclude so many, et cetera, et cetera. We think about then, well, what, what do we want these students who, who are not centered? What do we want them to come out of this, you know, schooling experience or institution with? And when we think about, you know, social education being social justice, we know that, you know, if a program, if a child can go through kindergarten until 12th grade, if they make it that far, and not ever see themselves represented and never feel that they even were visible or could be their complete authentic self or could have that space to figure out who they want to be mm. authentically, then we know we've done a huge injustice. Mm. So when we think about education as social justice, we know that it has to serve the collective. Mm. It can't be a situation where, you know, we celebrate the fact that a certain percentage of our students are going off to these great mm -hmm. Ivy League colleges but yet we have students who are deeply broken or who yeah. are, and they might be amongst those people going mm -hmm. to the colleges. Sure. So I think ultimately what we think about is we think about the power of the collective mm -hmm. and we think about every single person that comes through our care and serving them justly and equitably. Mm -hmm. And for us, if, if schooling and if education does not do that, then we know that mm -hmm. it's not true education. What is yeah. it doing? Mm -hmm. yeah. If it doesn't elevate the collective, it's not, it's a, it's a Ubuntu, you know, it's just a Ubuntu, which is a very Absolutely. heart of, uh, of the culture of our continent. I mean, as diverse as our continent <clears> is, <throat> I think that Ubuntu-ness yes. is, translates. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think so many times people think about education as the subjects. Well, you need to learn math and you need to learn science and you need to learn language, arts, etc. But that those are subjects. And that's not what education is something so much bigger than it's that. It's more holistic. Yeah. Yeah. How do you interact with people? You know, like schools, there is the explicit curriculum and then there's the implicit curriculum. Yeah. You know, in many ways, we teach students to conform. In many ways, we teach students to be competitive with, another, with one another. Mm -hmm. In For many sure. ways, we teach them to be divisive. Now, again, schools are designed in a way so that students can fit seamlessly into the workforce. So these are reflection of our current social and economic systems. Mm -hmm. Though we're doing the work at a grassroots level, our yeah. hope and uh, our hopes and dreams and aspirations for our, for our students and our children is that they're actually going to redesign the way we live as human mm. beings. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful statement to redesign how we live. So let's let's bring it to the home. You know, these kids go home at the end of the day, mm. <laughs> eventually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's talk to some of the, the parents who might be listening who are not educators, but they're listening at this from a lens as a parent or maybe mm. they're a caregiver, or maybe yes. they're an auntie who just loves their babies mm. and they want to be the best auntie they can. You know, mm. how, do, how do we start to kind of bring some of that social justice into the spaces at home for our children and for those kids that we love? Mm. Yes. Uh, well, we're, you know, you mentioned before that we're also parents. And so I always, whenever I hear any question about, you know, parenting, I'm always like, I can't give any advice. We're trying to figure this out too. We, we'll see you at the finish line. Same, we same, same. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think in terms of, in terms of, you know, what some of the things that we try um, to share and we're also trying to live by is really being proud of who you are. Mm -hmm. I think especially as 
a black person or a person who is of the, you know, of African descent or who's brown or who feels, you know, not centered in any way through mm. their faith, through mm. their race, through ethnicity, through language. I think that one of the most powerful things we can teach our own children when they come home is that we also have a tradition and that we also have a story mm. and that we also, our ancestors also had a way of doing this. Mm. And that it's not that one narrative that maybe you learned in the textbook that is the only narrative. In right. fact, we bring so much to this world and we've brought so much of this. I think, you know, especially as people from the continent, oftentimes we think that, you know, we, when we're speaking our, our mother tongue with our family, we can be a certain way. And then when we're in, in educational spaces, we need to speak a certain way and that certain places, you know, we're not valid. Right. But I think as parents, one of the most powerful things that we can teach our kids is that, you know, you are valid and our, our way is also valid. Mm -hmm. And it's also a beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, thing to teach your peers, to teach your teacher. Um, so I think empowering your kids. And some of that is even as simple as, you know, sometimes I see little beautiful black girls that look like my daughters with, you know, beautiful kinky hair or whatever. And they're carrying the backpack that has the blonde Barbie, has on, Barbie it, right? on it. Mm. Or that has oh, the, I see it everywhere. Right, or everywhere. the Frozen character. Mm. And I'm like, as much as, you know, I'm sure that child loves that character, like mm -hmm. so many of their peers, mm. it also makes me wonder, what, what is she seeing yeah. in that, mm -hmm. you know? And, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, um, do, you know, do, you, do you know Diaz, the, the writer, mm. said something really beautiful. He said, if you want to make um, a child a monster, you, you deny them any reflection of themselves. At a mm. cultural level. At a mm. cultural mm. level, at school, at home. And I think there's so much truth in that. Mm. So I think ref allowing your kids to see themselves mm. reflected in beautiful, intelligent, mm. knowledgeable mm. ways is one of the, I think, most powerful things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, social justice work is anti-oppression work. You know, it's, mm. it's work of liberation. And that means you have to be opposing particular forces. So everything happens in relation to the dominant culture, which imposes its ways upon others in, any, in, in a particular so society or in a particular uh, environment. Now, that dominant culture may vary from context to context, context but it's primarily very Eurocentric yeah. and Western. And the idea that, you know, the Western mm. ideologies are correct this is the right way of disciplining your children, or this is the right way of doing this or that, which we know throughout history has caused a lot of pain uh, and, uh, and uh, mm. a lot of exploitation. And so people have to be prepared, uh, parents, to gather the courage also to resist oppressive forces mm. when they manifest themselves in an interaction between Absolutely. peers, between students, or between teacher and student. We have a workshop that we host for parents. It's called Social Justice Education Starts at Home. Parents have to be hands-on. For sure. Even as, as educators, you know, it, it, it's not wise to leave the education of your children up to institutions. You have to be involved. You have to build a genuine partnership mm -hmm. with teachers. Mm -hmm. You have to let them know this is our framework. These are lines that we're not willing to cross. Can we have dialogue about this? And at the same time, have a particular disposition with our children at home that makes them feel secure in a sense that they can bring up any issue at mm. home without feeling fear of being reprimanded or disciplined in, in mm -hmm. a harsh manner. Yeah. That's have hard to, to be, do. Dialogue is key. Yeah. It is hard to do. It's hard. It is very hard to do. Yeah. But dialogue is key. Because mm. ultimately, if students are questioning, and if you are from a culturally diverse background, you have to navigate a, a particular culture at home and you come to school, you have to navigate in a different yes, way. Right. It's very- right. And uh, you're exhausted at the end of the day. It's a, ex now imagine if you're a six year old mm. or yeah. now if you're a nine year old or 13 year old having to do these mental acrobatics. Yeah, your hormones are raging, you're developing, you, you don't know what's what. You have to yeah, be able to lean into some people, right? Yeah, to have absolutely. wise conversation, to better mm. understand things. Yeah. So I would say dialogue is key. Yeah. Provide that space at home to be able to have these conversations with, with your children. Yeah. And then the other thing is curate resources. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And curate also like in crazy. the, in the like manner. Crazy. Right. Yeah. And, and one thing that we've committed to doing also is through our spending power, what brands are we supporting? Mm. Is social justice just talk in the classroom? Or are we actually walking the walk? Absolutely. Right. When we go and stay at a resort or at a hotel, is it somehow tied to a colonial legacy? Yeah, come on right? now. I mean, we've had this conversation. But hard to find at times. Time. Very hard, hard to find. Hello. But you know, even that. Kenyan tourism agencies. Uh, yeah, yes. yes, exactly. But I think even in that struggle, that's where the learning happens. So yeah, we, you know, we have a child who's now 11 years old. And it's, it's in, so his job now is to look up the place. So we might go to a place and say, 
Your job is to look up the, who we want to know who the owner is. We want to see the pictures. We want to see what it looks like. And there are times where it's so difficult and we're like, you know, what do we do in this situation? Yep. And mm-hmm. that is, I think it's in that conversation where the learning happens. Is Absolutely. Why is it so hard to, to be able to go, you know, enjoy time together at a place that doesn't have a very painful, oppressive history? Why is it difficult to find, you know, a shoe brand that you love that is not exploitative? You know, That's why not is being it made by... Twelve-year-old children that looks just like you, mm-hmm. just, that like looks you. just like exactly. you. Yeah. So I think it's even in having those real conversations. I think that the one thing I would say too is um, is to be honest. We have a lot of parents who are like, "Is it too early to talk about?" You know, we don't want to take away the joy. We don't want to, yeah. you know, put this. Well, dark let's talk cloud. about that. Let's talk about that from different angles. Mm-hmm. Sure. I think that joy thing is so central. Mm-hmm. If you if you love a child in any capacity, the one of the beautiful things you love about them is their kind of carefree, yes. you know, mm-hmm. uh, lens towards the world. So mm-hmm. I think there is. The black, brown, queer, differently abled child who mm. has to navigate the world because of the way God created them, which mm. is beautiful and perfect in its own way. Mm-hmm. And they have to deal with that mm-hmm. and they want to maintain their joy. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then there's a parent who may have a child who doesn't have some of those obvious burdens who can navigate the world with maybe some more ease. And they maybe may resist, including social justice, because their child is six and they mm. don't want to talk about those heavy things. Yes. I think there's two sets of parents at times that we're talking about. And sometimes we fit in both places of privilege. I mm. sit in a lot of seats of privilege. Absolutely. Mm. And yes. I have to help my kids remember who is not sitting with us. Mm. And then there are times where, you know, we're the ones fighting upstream. So mm-hmm. t- talk us through both, maintaining joy in both spaces and also being a proper, I don't like the word ally, so I'm not sure what the best words are these days, mm. but, mm. you know, being socially just in both places mm. perhaps is a better mm. way to frame it. Well, I think, first of all, in terms of just being honest with kids, we have a two and a half year old and just the other day she's watching one of her favorite shows, this, this Ada Twist, you know, Barack Scientist. Obama and oh, Michelle yeah. Obama produced this amazing show mm. about this beautiful little black girl who's a scientist. And it's an she illustrated has book to begin with. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so she looked at the screen, she said, Ada Twist is black like me. I said, yes, she is. And then she said, um, the other character, Iggy, Iggy Peck, Peck is, mm. is white. Mm. I said, yes. And oh, Rosie Revere is white too. I said, yes, she is. There, you know, I think there are so many parents who even that alone would is shake like, them. Oh, yeah. oh, why yeah. are we, you know, why did you know? Almost that there's a problem with that. Well, why are we talking about that? There's nothing, you know, why are we even mentioning that? I think the first thing is that kids are going to come through this world and they're going to notice. So, you, you know, if we act like it's, it's not there, then we can't ever really grow and learn with them and have these authentic experiences. But I think in terms of joy, we, you know, we find so much joy in justice. Mm. Um, there's oh, humor in justice, yes. right? There is. There is. Yes. There is there's humor in recognizing mm. certain things. There's and then, self-love in justice. Absolutely. Mm. And even those glimpses of, you know, we might not have achieved social justice yet mm. um, as a you know, global collective. But I think even the approach to it or even striving towards it, there's mm. so much joy within that process. Yes, there is. Yes, um, there is. So and so I, I think that sometimes we, ha- we think mm. that there's a dichotomy. We talk about serious things. Mm. We're going to be sad mm. and depressed. Mm. And, you know, we're going to put this gloomy cloud over our kids. Yes, yes. But there's also affinity, right? And, mm. you know, in, mm. in, in the struggle. And so funny things are one of our, our son uh, was in art class and he said that the teacher flashed a picture of Jesus Christ. And he said, Jesus was blonde with blue eyes. And me, so he's talking about himself now, him and his brethren, who's in the class, also an African, looked at each other and and started giggling. And 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 then they, and then, and we're talking about fourth grade. And then they did this, you know, they said, it's an act of rebellion, but at least they had each other. Absolutely, yes. You see? So it's it's never too early to begin to heighten their critical consciousness. Absolutely. And the thing is, there there were giggles there. I think that was the beautiful part, right? And I think it's like, when you're with your closest <laughs> friend and you see something and yeah. the two of you notice yeah. it, yeah. there's there's humor there and there's there are spaces to laugh. And if you model that, if you model that, you know, we can't fix everything overnight, but we can try and we can laugh along the Absolutely. way. Absolutely. You know, I think Absolutely. There's, there's a Absolutely. lot of joy there. And that's actually, I mentioned at the beginning, the poem, The Revolution not, Will Not Be Televised. What's One of the beautiful things about that spoken word piece is set to music. Mm. It's groovy. It's funky. Makes you want to dance It makes you want to dance. You're like, time. what am I doing right now? Am I dancing? Am I fighting? <laughs> What am I doing? You know, but that is, I think, the beauty of our people also. Yes. There is no way we survive this moment fighting for justice since the inception of time without a whole lot of joy mm. as our fellow sojourner True. on this path.
Absolutely. Have, you know, joy and justice. That's what we're about. Yeah. I'm like, hello. I, that's it. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. That's, you just put it so, so beautifully. Okay. We're going to wrap up with maybe a, a quote from, you know, Brother Malcolm, mm. who said that education is a passport for the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. So as we kind of close this conversation, you know, tell us how your work, how we can join in your work, actually. Mm in preparing students, our kids, people we love, our schools, the communities that we're in mm -hmm. for tomorrow, for the future. How can we do that a bit better? Mm. For a better socially just future, I should say. Yeah, wow. And you've said so much already, mm -hmm. but give us, give us your, your best, give us some freebies from your okay. workshop. <laughs> okay. I think I'm, I'm going to have to say, and it might, it might even sound redundant, but I'm going to have to say no matter where you are, whatever your, you know, your role in this world is, whatever your position is, I think being your truest self or at least trying to discover who that truest self could mm. be mm. is probably mm. you know, the biggest gift you could give any young person mm. because I think it gives them the permission to also do the same. Mm. So I think you know, if you're you know, a father and you're an accountant and you might feel like my job has nothing to do with anything yeah. social justice related, I think that you know, that's a false narrative. I think every single person mm. can bring justice or you know, learning or elevate their critical consciousness in the, in the space that they're in. You could be a stay-at-home grandparent. You could be whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that when children look up to us and they see that, and they see that courage to be your authentic self, to, to be humble, to mm -hmm. make mistakes, and to be on this quest of learning, you know, who your, your people were. What is the language that we spoke? What beautiful knowledge and ways of knowing did we offer this civilization in this time that we're mm -hmm. living in? That is a huge lesson, I think, for kids. And I think mm -hmm. when kids look up to us, and they see us doing that, it, it gives them that, that courage mm. to do the same. Mm. Thank you, Sasha. How about you, Amin? Empowers in the people, mm. you know? Absolutely. This work needs critical mass. Um, so dialogue, mm -hmm. again, is at the heart of this, uh, this work. Uh, understanding that we continuously have to unlearn in order to relearn, you know? Everybody, I mean, people have been <clears throat> programmed in a particular way through, based on their experiences, their lived experience and and all that they've ingested, you know, whether it has been, um, they, whether it has been pushed by themselves or pushed upon them. Right. Um, so we have to be cognizant of that. And the, I think the other thing is modeling. We have to also be very aware of power dynamics. You know, our children watch everything that we do. You know, they will do as we do. They will not do as we say. Absolutely, yeah. 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 So how do you speak to a person who is in a lesser position of power than you, as opposed to somebody who is you feel is more powerful? For Just sure. the small mm -hmm. things, day-to-day -day interactions go a long way. So charity sure. starts at home. If we yeah. begin with the self and then uh, come together... Absolutely. I mean, I hear you saying right both two very profound things, you know, Saja, you saying we just each need to be free, mm. like truly seeking that freedom within ourselves. When we are free, we will have, you know, be seeking the freedom of others. And I mean, what you said, you know, that equity, that justice begins at home. And, you know, one of the questions I didn't ask you was kind of what do we have to surrender to, mm. to become socially just? And I mm. think wow. it mm. is a bit of this. It's that privilege, like mm. revoking that privilege and that power and, and using it in the service of others, mm. you know, and every day. Yes, in the everyday, yes. in the everyday. Um, so I'd like to close the show with two questions that I didn't give you in advance because I'd like to have honest answers okay, on this one. Lily. So, um, yeah, so the first one's easy. What's your favorite drink? Ooh, give it to me. Um, ginger beer. Mm. Oh, that is an unexpected twist. Mm. What, like stony? Of course. Tango Weezy? Mm. Yes. Okay, okay, that's a yeah. heavy it's one. A, too. That thing bites you before you it, drink it. It's you know, like... and because I'm, I don't drink alcohol, I feel like yeah. it gives you something fancy to drink. Fancy. Right? It's bubbling. So, it's, mm. Stony Tango Easy with an umbrella. That's it. And a yeah. slice of something. Or in a big mug if I want to be like a, a real bad gal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, how about you? What's your favorite That's beverage? a hard question. <laughs> I was going to say a dawa. A dawa. Or, uh, you Good know, Kahawa is king. Yeah, Kahawa or, is king. Or, or, or Thank queen. you. I've been waiting or for... Or queen for equity. Listen, so. listen, I'm good with king too, but I've been waiting for someone to say Kahawa. No one has said it on this show. People have been saying chai every week. So thank you for bringing Kahawa <laughs> to the conversation. <laughs> and then lastly, you know, what is bringing you joy? Oh, wow. So many things. I think these days, my babies, you know, mm, I think yes. my babies, yeah, my babies are bringing me joy. I think, um, I, you know, just every time you look at a, a, a child, I, I'm a lover of 
children and you know they're they're always around us they're driving us bonkers mm. it's loud there's music playing kids are dancing kids are fighting mm. in our house all the time i think when i just take a pause and i look around i'm like alhamdulillah this is mm. you know the, the biggest blessing to be surrounded by that beautiful noise so and babies okay i mean yeah. you can't say mm. the babies so you gotta well, get family you know uh, <laughs> but learning for me brings me joy mm. you know i'm very ambitious Although we're outnumbered on the home front, He's there on his guitar. you know, ding, ding, I'm still ding, ding, pursuing, you know, the things okay. that, you're that, taking guitar that I lessons? love. Actually, I spy on my son when he's taking his guitar lessons. Okay. Okay. And then I try to apply it when they're all sitting at the dinner table. I'm enforcing <laughs> order. You know? That's excellent. It's true. That's excellent. Uh, well, listen, um, I just I just I'm so glad to be in your orbit to share space and community with you. I just love you both. Thank you. I appreciate you so, so deeply for the work you do. You know, we're having a lot of fun and we're laughing, but the work that you do is not easy. It does come at a cost. You're the kind of educators that lose sleep at night mm. over lesson plans and how did that conversation go? And did that parent feel heard and did that mm. student feel Absolutely, seen? Yeah. So I just want to say I see and hear and appreciate your work and mm. your deep commitment to students and equity and communities not just the ones that are in your classroom that you know know you're as Mr. Hussein and Ms. Khalil, but those everyday people that you pass every day. Mm -hmm. um, you are educators in and out, through and through, and you are light and you are salt and you're blessing. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you for being on Salam and Hello. Thank, thank you, you. So, so glad you're here. These folks don't have much of a digital print uh, footprint out there, but we are going to link in the show notes their website so you can find Indigenous Education and mm -hmm. reach out to Sajda and Amin. And I would love to hear from you as well. So you can always send me a message at Lily at salamandhello.com or just follow us on social, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know how it is, at Salam and Hello. And join us next week for another episode. Peace.